looks like it's time for showtime. Showtime. yesterday, all the um, great work that's been going on here. Saw a number of solar panels up and about, and we didn't quite touch them, but we wanted to. <laughs> <laughs> we were very close. Um, my name is Tim Carter. I am the, the president of uh, Second Nature, and we're really uh, thrilled for this day to be here and uh, to really uh, talk about and announce and think through what climate leadership looks like. Uh, moving forward for, for really the higher sector and then um, more broadly out into society. Um, a couple of housekeeping things. I was told to mute the cell phones if you have them because we have multiple recording devices going on and we don't want to disturb that. Um, the course of this morning is going to be, um, I'll give a, some brief remarks and some presidents here will give some brief remarks and then we'll actually have a, the signing ceremony. Uh, and then we're going to transition to really some thought leadership and um, with the rest of the group uh, out in, in another spot. So hang tight here. Um, we'll get through this piece, and then and then we'll really get our brains engaged after the coffee has time to kick in. <laughs> so I I did want to give a little bit of background. Um, you know, Second Nature as an organization is is over 20 years old, and. It has, uh, since its beginning, had the idea that higher education could really be a transformative element in society. And it was already always thinking about that. And over the course of its history, then, it has spun off. Some nonprofits have actually spun off of it. Um, there's been very unique partnerships amongst different schools that have been the result of Second Nature's work. Um, and it has expanded in breadth nationally. You know, it may have started in the Northeast, but then it expanded nationally. And there has been really great impact. I think um, many of you know Yogi Berra, the late great Yogi Berra. He said, when you come to a fork in the road, take it. And uh, in some ways, Second Nature has been opportunistic in the way in which it has expanded its leadership around uh, sustainability. And our current mission, you know, we really wanted to focus on those things throughout our history and our current uh, conditions that really have made us uh, the organization that we are today. And that is to really initiate uh, bold commitments. And that's really the anchor point for us as an organization. Um, what do the bold commitments look like in higher ed? What do bold commitments look like by senior leadership in higher ed? And then given those bold commitments, how can we scale these successful actions that people take? So that's really important that when a network exists, you don't just treat individual schools as individual schools, but we can actually provide scale. And as an organization that helps to manage those commitments, we can do that. And then we really wanted to be out at the leading edge and, and really think about how do we accelerate innovative solutions. So there are individual schools that are doing things that are really pushing the edge, and many of those schools are in the room today. So how can we help accelerate that? How can we take what you're doing individually and then spread it more widely across the network? So those three areas of our mission are really important. They're still core to what we're about, and I think today is an indication of how, by empowering the network and thinking about different ways we've expanded the full commitments, um, we can be a stronger organization. Hopefully the schools can do uh, better work uh, with that support. So I want to take just a second to really think about some of the background of sustainability, because it's been such a relatively new Thing. I mean, it's in the, only in the past, you, know, you can roughly look at 10 years ago and what was happening 10 years ago versus what is happening now, and you really see a remarkable difference. Um, one of our good partners, uh, the Association for the Advancement of Sustainability in Higher Education, ASHE, um, has done a survey year after year to look at what are the sustainability trends, and in 2005 they said, there were roughly, estimated roughly 80 sustainability officers around the country. And when they did their most recent survey, there was uh, 
300 that responded to the survey, and as you know, uh, responses to the survey is a small proportion of the actual amount. So there are, there's at least a fourfold increase in just the number of sustainability positions around the country. And we've also seen this great explosion in the number of majors, the number of centers, the number of initiatives that transcend really just the academic side. And you probably can't find a school today that doesn't have sustainability as some part of their marketing material. You know, it's really embedded into the infrastructure, literally and figuratively, of higher education today. And I think we can say it's not a, a small part uh, due to the uh, American College and University President's Climate Commitment, the ACUPCC, which is uh, hands down the toughest acronym to remember. <laughs> and if we all tried to say it three times fast, we would not be successful. But it really has been a catalytic uh, commitment that presidents made on behalf of their universities to become uh, carbon neutral uh, by a certain date. And they had to pick a date. It was a tangible action that they had to do. And you had to measure progress, and then you had to publicly report on that. And um, you know, it was founded, it was launched in coordination with ACI, as well as Eco America, two other national nonprofits. Um, and for the past uh, many number of years, uh, Second Nature has been the, the organization that supported that ACUPCC effort. And so, when we look at back at how does the ACUPCC how, why is that important? How is it important? Do people really tell us it's important? Are we just thinking that ourselves? We actually ask our sustainability staff, it, has this been an important initiative for you? And 98% of the staff of the schools that we surveyed said their president signing the ACPCC was an important uh, initiative for their work. So that's hugely catalytic. And it provides, again, an institutional infrastructure to do the sustainability work on campus. And that, you know, now the ACUPCC is, is nine years old. You know, it's roughly that same time horizon during this same explosion. And so it's worth reflecting on, given nine years of understanding and learning about the initiative itself, how do we then advance it forward? How do we think about it and maybe a different, a different take, a different spin? Um, is that even needed or are we good? And I think it's important to think about how the world has changed in those nine years, not just how higher ed has changed this expansion of sustainability. But we also have the world as a very different place. And um, in some ways, the world of climate in particular is a very different place when we think about implementing carbon neutrality on campuses. I think when you think about the um, you know, renewable energy portfolios and landscapes, what people are calling new energy, um, it's a very uh, different time now, and actually an unanticipated time, I looked 10 years ago. Um, there was roughly, just as an example, um, solar installations around the country. There was roughly 70 megawatts of solar that were installed in 2005. And any guesses on the number of megawatts that were last year? Over 7,000 megawatts of solar was installed last year. So over the course of 10 years, this industry has radically changed. And that means a lot for higher ed. I mean, just from an industry perspective, how, how are we preparing people for this different type of economy? Uh, but then it also says, well, what's the opportunity to really accelerate our own efforts? And what does this uh, commitment look like now that it didn't look like a number of years ago? I think, um, you know, at the time of the commitment when it was launched, there was a very different conversation politically that was happening. You know, there was uh, bills in Congress that might have been passed and, and weren't. Um, student activism around this issue was very high, and um, you see that kind of uh, grassroots um, founding was a big nudge to get presidents to sign on to the commitment. And I actually think that's a little bit different now. You know, when we think about the sophistication of the signing and the sophistication of the field, really, um, we have to be responsive to that as people who are um, you know, overseeing and leading the commitment. And we have to push schools that are coming on board to be, um, you know, this is a serious thing. This isn't a declaration. This is actually something that has real implications for your campus. And it's possible to make that change happen. So I think over the nine years, we've actually learned that it's, you know, we can move from a, a strict activism perspective to a much more sophisticated and holistic perspective about what this means for your campus. <coughs> So, let's
let's fast forward to today. ACPCC is launched nine years ago, and now how successful has it been? Has it been a success? I know we said, obviously, it's established a, a framework for the work that sustainability officers are doing. Um, but we have, you know, over 600 schools that are part of this network now. Um, we have many of them who have aggressively started to ratchet up their carbon neutrality goals. You know, a number of them have become carbon neutral. We have a group of roughly 40 schools that um, by 2020 are planning to become carbon neutral. So it's a kind of a ramping up period where many schools have done the initial stage early, maybe the easier stuff, and they're ready to move on to the more uh, challenging um, opportunities to get to this goal that they've set out for them. Um, and, you know, school, President Ferguson is here, and, um, you know, you look at Ball State putting in some massive geothermal installations. Um, it's really as much about the economic reasons to do this as it is about um, caring for the planet, even though caring for the planet drives all of this as well. So I think um, we've seen that over the years, and as we've compiled stories around the network, we see there are many different reasons why people have progressed and how, how they are successful. Um, Ball State's a good example of, of you know, a different type of reason and one that makes total economic sense. Um, another thing I think that is actually relatively newer and, and perhaps more profound even of a change is that this response to climate, how do we understand that the conditions around us, the world is changing, not just in the how does the energy system work, but how does the whole environment work around us. That has driven campuses and communities more generally to try to think about we are living in this world of change. And so that's really this focus on resilience. And um, last year, in 2014, Second Nature initiated some resilience work with the Alliance for Resilient Campuses. And that was some early stage thinking about what is that um, adaptation, preparedness, um, proactive thinking about the future. What does that look like for campuses? What are the key things that need to be in place for resilience to be successful? And we really found that one of the key characteristics was you can't do it as a campus, you can't be a, become, increase your resilience as a campus without completely integrating with your community and working together with your community to make that happen. That Alliance for Resilient Campuses, um, you know, the initiative was, was very broad in its focus, and, um, and now, today, uh, one of the exciting things that we'll talk about is how, do we, how can we formalize and actually streamline and integrate um, the resilience work that was started last year into um, our current effort. So we'll mention that in a second. I think the other piece of resilience is that it shows up now in the cultural dialogue, I think in a way that it hadn't five years ago. So when we, you know, even with Joaquin actively happening, people are thinking about, they can refer right back to Sandy, they can refer then back to Katrina, they can think about how have we then changed our operations, our culture, our societal practices in order for this, um, you know, the next thing that comes, how can we anticipate that future? And I don't think that was necessarily the case as explicitly as it is now, um, five years ago. So, given this history and um, this important legacy that we have through the ACPCC, we come to today's announcement. So after, um, you know, it's roughly a year of really intensive strategic planning and then, um, you know, working with the steering committee, many of you uh, are here and a number of the steering committee members who aren't here um, have participated in numerous, <laughs> countless maybe, uh, <coughs> calls. Um, we're really excited to launch these uh, three climate leadership commitments. And these are um, commitments that will take the place of, um, in name, those uh, initiatives that we had started before the Alliance for Resilient Campuses and the ACUPCC. And it's really, um, we can break these each commitment down. So the first one, the, what the ACUPCC um, used to be called, uh, well, is, is called now and, and the future will not be called, is uh, the Carbon Commitment. So we've transitioned ACUPCC to the Carbon Commitment and it really maintains the same um, fundamental goals. It's uh, basically intact uh, from the prior ACUPCC, so the commitment itself isn't 
fundamentally changing. We've actually reflected a little bit on what the language of the commitment is, and you see that some of these tangible actions that were required as part of the commitment have been really relegated to be out of date. You know, we haven't updated them in nine years, and the world's changed in nine years. So what we've done is really think about how can those be um, pulled out uh, as um, something that can be a resource, but not necessarily part of that commitment. Secondly, so we have the carbon commitment. And then secondly, we really reflected on our resilience work and said, how could we introduce resilience as a presidential level commitment? And so that's one of the new commitments we're announcing today. And this provides, the resilience commitment provides a rigorous framework and way of measuring progress around resilience that will be emergent as we explore and understand more about how resilience implements itself across the country. Uh, we think that the campuses that have started with ARC and others that are doing good work around resilience are really well positioned to do that. Fundamental to the resilience commitment is uh, the connection with the community. So you can't be this resilient campus without having really strong community connections. So we have two things now. We have a carbon commitment. We have a resilience commitment. And combined together, the carbon and resilience commitment are this new integrated climate commitment. And so the climate commitment represents really the most holistic of the climate leadership commitments that uh, we're introducing today. And it's just a full integration and really a streamlining of these two initiatives of carbon neutrality and resilience. So what does that mean uh, moving forward for the network? Well, it really means that carbon committers uh, are now really pushing the agenda is still in carbon neutrality. It's not an easy goal, and it's not going to uh, uh, become easy just because we say change the name. Um, they will continue on. We actually have uh, today 45, actually 46, um, get some late editions, but 46 uh, schools have committed to the integrated climate commitment, this new climate commitment which is really fantastic because, you know, you haven't publicly launched something and we already have 45 schools interested and actually committed to signing it. It's, it's a really important step for them. So members who are part of the network, there are already carbon signatories that are interested in adding resilience have become these climate commitments. So it's a really exciting time for them to take a leadership role. I think it really demonstrates how um, you can push into a new initiative uh, knowing uh, much about the infrastructure and the framework that will take place, but also knowing uncertainty is part of it. And as presidents, everyone here knows that you live in this uncertain world and that oftentimes you're making decisions based on that. And I, we really applaud the senior leaders who have taken this initial step into the climate commitment, knowing that there is a lot of uh, work that needs to be done and learning that will take place over the course of the next few years to figure out how uh, we can increase our resilience on campuses while increasing that goal of getting to carbon neutrality faster. So, um, how does Second Nature then come alongside and help lead and support um, this new work? We've uh, today have uh, uh, initiated a sustainability planning and climate action guide, which has been completely uh, revamped and um, it's online, it's an online resource that will be a dynamic living resource for schools that have become signatories or are interested in becoming signatories. Um, we have a number of partnerships in the works that uh, we'll be rolling out over the next few months that can help support these efforts on <coughs> campuses. Um, just visually, you can see we've introduced kind of a more of a badge concept and that digital badging idea will be fleshed out over the next few months as we integrate physical presence, virtual presence, and content. Um, so it's a really important step to track and measure progress and compare uh, progress with other schools. So this is really all about visionary leadership on behalf of the presidents. You know, we couldn't do it without the presidential commitments. We couldn't do it without the presidential support. And um, what we really are hopeful for is that that network that was started, you know, really nine years ago continues to flourish and really mature in qualitative ways. You know, we really want the schools to be at the leading edge to be serious about these commitments. And it's not for everybody. It's a hard thing to do. We recognize that and we, we really uh, want the schools on board whose leadership really sees it as a, as a priority for them and can make it a reality for them. 
So that's the announcement this morning. We're really excited about it. Um, I want to uh, turn it over to three presidents who are going to give a little brief take on what, why the climate commitment was important for them, um, and all three are here, fortunately. <laughs> um, and first off is President Keish from uh, Agnes Scott College. She's going to uh, talk a little bit about how Agnes Scott got into this. Thanks. Thanks, Tim. Way down. Okay. <laughs> uh, good morning, everybody. And, and Tim, I just I want to say on behalf of the presidents how excited we are about your leadership. Uh, this uh, this organization has been an incredible learning community. But to have your vision and energy and and the fabulous staff of Second Nature um, who have worked so hard uh, to to uh, pull this off and to make this happen. So on behalf of all the presidents, thank you so much. <laughs> I just, I want to say, first of all, I'm so excited that uh, this is happening at Agnes Scott, and I do think that there's something symbolic about that, and that's what I want to very, very briefly talk about, that what makes this, uh, what has made this network so extraordinarily valuable is that it is a learning network. I mean, I remember, you know, this is my 10th year as president. Uh, we, are, we were charter signatories of, of the ACUPCC commitment. And it was this moment, I remember with Susan Kidd, my wonderful uh, executive director of our Center for Sustainability was here as we were trying to figure out, can we do this as a school with less than 1,000 students in the South, uh, not a place that was regarded as you know, innovative in, air, in um, sustainability. And so we took this leap but it was a leap into a learning network of colleagues all across the country. And it is very exciting to see what has been accomplished, you know, just looking around this room and then thinking about all of our colleagues um, across the country. And for us, you know, what we realized was joining this network would push us further than we would ever, ever could conceive of otherwise. And so the fact that we do have a quarter megawatt of solar power uh, on this on this campus that we have a, a half a million dollar green revolving fund all of the things that have happened over the last 10 years I give the ACUPCC uh, total credit for you know for giving us that support and that set of colleagues and and for embracing uh, higher ed in its great diversity in this country and so you know yesterday on our campus tour Diane Harrison who has 41,000 students uh, at Cal State Northridge and Agnes Scott which has less than a thousand students in Decatur Georgia um, if the fact that we are colleagues in this effort uh, and that we are building this learning community together is I think very exciting and that schools at every scale, both public and private, have been able to participate in this network and, and learn from it um, is, uh, and, and really make extraordinary progress as a result. And so for us, it's been um, an amazing learning journey. It's involved everybody on campus. I often think that for higher education, it's really a triple bottom line because we, we have to think about our operational leadership. You know, we have scale, as Tim said, across the country, our institutions represent facilities and operational scale. We are also thought leaders as research institutions, but we're also thought leaders as practitioners. And so engaging the, the triple bottom line for me and per perhaps the most important for Agnes Scott is we are educating climate leaders for tomorrow. And so we've been, we've engaged our students with every piece of this, the greenhouse gas emissions inventory, every piece of this. So now as we expand the commitment to resilience, uh, I think that will be a new, uh, a new call for leadership and for stretching ourselves and for thinking about ways in which whatever our scale as colleges and universities, how can we engage our communities? How can we uh, um, be leaders and conveners in, in um, adapting to a changing climate and figuring out smart strategies for, for doing that? So it is, I think, exactly the right move for climate leadership to add that piece of resilience. If anybody needs a reminder of that, you just have to look at what's happening in South Carolina and the, you know, our fellow institutions uh, up in South Carolina 
who are, are faced with yet another of these one in a thousand year weather catastrophes, which we know as the climate changes are going to become more and more frequent. So, um, so again, I'm just I'm excited to be a part of this. I think I hope that we can get many more of those initial uh, almost 700 schools to sign on to the to the integrated commitment and other schools that um, have not yet become signatories who as the as uh, more and more um, information becomes so clear about the importance of stepping up and facing and navigating climate challenges will join this network uh, and become a part of this uh, learning and leadership community so now it's my great pleasure to uh, turn the podium over to Vin Vivel, who is, I'm going to now practice this, he is chair of the Climate Leadership Network Steering Committee. <laughs> thank you, Elizabeth, and, and thank you very much for uh, hosting us at this, this absolutely classic, uh, beautifully uh, located and Landscapes. Uh, I don't know how many landscapers we have. <laughs> <laughs> we have one. Uh, really, a beautiful campus. It's a pleasure to be here. And uh, yeah, this is very exciting. Uh, very exciting. Although I, I was proud that I finally could, in fact, say ACUB. <laughs> over it. So now I have to relearn. Uh, I'm the chair of the steering committee of the Climate Leadership Network. <laughs> That's any easier for me. So. <laughs> Um, you know, Portland State is, is uh, uh, just sort of an opposite to Agnes Scott, you know, 29,000 students uh, right in the heart of the city, a uh, campus of 49 acres. How many acres do you have? Uh, yeah, right. So <laughs> think about the density portion. <laughs> you know, but you might say, oh yeah, well, Portland State, it's got to be easy because uh, a care for the environment has been part of Oregon and, and Portland's DNA for a long time. Of course, it was one of the first states to, you know, absolutely declare uh, all the beaches to be publicly owned. First state to have a, a bottle bill. Uh, we've had an urban growth boundary for all metropolitan areas for a long time to preserve both agricultural and natural land. You may remember the big fight over the spotted owl. Uh, you know, this has been going on for a long time. Um, so in that sense, it was not a major miracle that in 2006, Portland State would sign on to the ACUPCC with the carbon commitment. Uh, we were joined, uh, the city of Portland was one of the first, was the first city in the country to have a climate action plan. So we integrated our climate action planning uh, with them. And it was interesting because at that time, in many ways, and I think Tim, you were absolutely right in pointing out the change that's happened even in just the last 10 years, that we didn't necessarily all that often see what we, what we would identify as direct consequences of climate change, right? I mean, there were little things, but nothing that we were so aware of. For us, we focused really on questions of preservation of landscape and on reducing carbon because of air quality issues and concerns about it. Fuel. Uh, our major win in this area really was that we went, you know, we're a commuter campus, really. We only have about 10% of our students living on campus, the rest commutes in. And uh, 15 years ago, something like 80% of students, faculty, and staff commuted by private automobile. It's now down to 25%. Mm -hmm. Now, that didn't just happen, not just through us. You know, you don't build parking garages, that's one way of keeping down the uh, automobiles. <laughs> Uh, promote bike lanes uh, and work very closely with your uh, public transportation agency where we've over the last 15 years done a lot of new both streetcar line and light rail lines that have in fact made it possible. You can't just tell people not to do something without creating uh, an alternative that, that actually works. But then it, it sort of really became personal for me uh, three years ago when uh, my daughter, who lives in uh, Long Beach on Long Island, uh, got flooded out uh, by Sandy. And uh, just like for some people it was Katrina, for me it was really that experience of seeing what she and her neighbors went through, where you began to really realize how immediate the impact on one's life can be. And that has only continued, if not gotten worse. The organs had the worst two fire seasons in the last two years, along with Washington uh, and California. And then going beyond just climate consequences, I don't know how many of you read the article about three months ago in the New Yorker, 
about the uh, major earthquake that will happen off the coast of Oregon. And the quote in that article that uh, really caught everybody's attention in Oregon was, everything west of I-5, I-5 is the major highway right, that runs from Vancouver down to LA, everything west of I-5 will be toast. That's a great line to get people's attention. Uh, it's not quite accurate. It's a bit of hyperbole, thank God. Uh, but nevertheless, it made people pay attention. But then it was very interesting. The first article there was purely about how horrible and disastrous this will be. And there's like a 30% chance of that earthquake hitting in the next 50 years. Um, but then the next article was really great because it was all about resilience. It was all about, so what are we going to do? We're not all going to move. We're not moving uh, everything along the coast. So how do we deal with this? And to me, that really uh, speaks to how I see the resilience commitment and why I'm so uh, interested in it is because we have to think about preparedness in such a broad sense. The climate issues are a very big part of it. It's obviously playing out in ways that we can't even always predict, you know, in all kinds of different places and ways, whether it's about fire and drought and extreme rain events. And even we see in Oregon a lot of people moving in because they feel that Oregon is actually relatively good compared to the Southwest or California in, in terms of its climate. Uh, but it, we have a lot of other challenges as well. And of course, the uh, horrible events of last week in, in, in Roseburg are an utter reminder of just the level of emergency preparedness and resilience that our institutions need to cope with everything that is, is thrown at us. Um, we still have to focus on carbon reduction very much, because even though we now know that we cannot stop climate change is happening, uh, we can uh, reduce its impact by continuing to work on carbon reduction as much and as fast as we can. But we have to do what we can to be prepared for all the many impacts that happen. This is not, as Tim said, it is not for the faint of heart. Uh, just uh, last week, my uh, uh, associate vice president for planning, who is sort of the, the guy ultimately in charge of making sure that we meet the plans, he said, did you read all the fine print on that commitment? <laughs> and I said, no, that's what I have you for. <laughs> but I know you're up to it. And he said, oh yeah, I'm up to it. <laughs> so uh, it, it takes serious work, but that's because the challenges are real and, and very serious. So we're ready for it, uh, and we think it's a great initiative, and we're all going to need each other's help and learning from each other to do this the right way. So I look forward to continuing to work on it with everybody. And now I'm going to turn over the podium to Paul Ferguson, who is the vice chair of the steering committee of the Climate Leadership Network, uh, and who is also the president of Ball State University in his spare time. Paul. <laughs> Thank you so much, Ray. Thank you for hosting us. And Tim, thank you for that wonderful overview. I think that set the stage beautifully. Well, Ball State uh, in general, and me in particular, are just so pleased to be here and join with all of you and I think, this extraordinary day. When you think of the history of our participation together, Ball State has had decades of commitment to sustainability. In the mid-80s, committing to a green campus and organizing students and faculty because they were committed to a dream of what that meant, not just for operations, but for quality of life. And being one of the early original signatories on the commitment, participating in quite a few incredible initiatives, being very fortunate to win the Climate Leadership Award from Second Nature 2010 for that wonderful project called the Geothermal Project. And that was an extraordinary statement in the Midwest and in Indiana to go to geothermal, uh, not only for the cost-effective energy savings that would eventually be returned to students and improve the quality of the campus. But it was a signature moment at Ball State that we're in. We're in to make those kinds of commitments that we're talking about today. And so I'm honored to be here and represent Ball State that's had a decades-long commitment to sustainability and climate leadership. And it comes at a very wonderful moment in, in our lives at Ball State University. This network that Elizabeth talked about, this mutual collegiality, has allowed us, I think, to continue to be visionary together 
Ball State is in the midst of a new strategic plan. When you think of the previous strategic plans that uh, Ball State has done, sustainability has been integral to it. There's been goals in there. And now we have a new strategic plan that is just going into play this year, and Ball State is getting ready to see its 100th anniversary in 2018. I was not there the entire time. <laughs> but our new vision that we've all embraced is that Ball State University aspires to be the most student-centered and community-engaged of the 21st century public research universities, transforming entrepreneurial learners into impactful leaders, committed to improving the quality of life for all. Now what that reflects is a focus on quality education and quality community engagement of transformation in our students, impact to our communities, but yet the quality of life improves because of who we are and what we do. And with that vision, this commitment today is so incredibly important. When you think 10 years ago we were motivated and enthused and inspired to join the network, <coughs> and 10 years later, and I love Tim's uh, comment that we were motivated 10 years ago by passion and activism and a sense of what we needed to do with what we knew then, but now with what we know now, we are inspired and enthused by the ability of science to go into practical, practical applications. And so it's beyond activism and belief today. It really goes into how strategy moves into operations and we change the world we live in. And that's where Ball State University is, where our students want to be. We have so many examples where they are engaged, not just by their passion, but by how they can make change. And if there's an improvement of life and the quality of life, that's, I think, the critical part of a 10-year reflection on who we are today and what this commitment is. So Ball State brings that commitment beyond activism, but to cost-effective energy savings so that we can improve the quality of life and that our students and our faculty joining with yours across the country can truly be impactful. And I'll just say one last concept about the network, which I thought was, was really quite insightful from Elizabeth. When you think of a network of presidents, uh, getting presidents together anytime is a wonderful thing because immediately uh, we start talking about what's good, what's bad, how's your life, how. But interesting, when the network gets together, it's cross cultural, it's cross geographical. Of the, this nation that is so great and diverse has so many different needs regarding climate leadership from the West to the East to the Midwest to the South. We get together to look at common challenges and goals to achieve the, the climate commitment. And so I again, commend Second Nature for their leadership. They truly have been a leader in helping us come together, helping us focus. And I really do commend my fellow presidents from their individual institutions with many challenges and, and diverse issues. But we come together for a common cause where we now feel we can start making significant progress. So Ball State is in. We're proud to be there, even as we were from the beginning. Thank you, Tim. Thanks, Paul. I think you get a sense from the comments even, the positive and really solutions-focused nature of the presidents that are here. And that's really the attitude that we have. It's not a doom and gloom scenario for us. It's really how do we solve this thing together. And it really is fine. You really see it can be possible. So there's a, a real positive energy around it. Um, we wanted to just briefly pause if there's any um, questions that anyone would have. Um, now would be the time to ask, bring them up, um, and after we take some Q&A, we're going to ask all the presidents who are here to come up and um, sign our, the new commitment. So any, any questions from audience, really, for any, any of the speakers or myself? Yeah, so we did both. We did um, both the targeted ask with the steering committee and then the Alliance for Resilient Campuses had a small group. And then we did um, just contact people briefly telling them that this event was happening and if they wanted to, they could um, sign on to the new integrated commitment. So they have been, the rest of the network has been communicated with, but today on the formal launch, we really wanted to, um, really today is really the offering for people to um, sign on to the integrated commitment. 
we'll have a number of resources available, webinars, et cetera, over the next uh, month that can help people who are interested in learning more about it, both within and without the network. Um, and that next month is kind of a, a key recruitment time for us too. Um, but right now, everyone has heard about it, and today, everyone now publicly has heard about it. So the commitments themselves have timelines attached to certain benchmarks. So within, you know, with the climate leadership, uh, the climate commitment, and all three of the climate leadership commitments, there's um, different timelines attached to, uh, you know, the first year you need to have uh, put together a campus community task force, for example, and you need to have uh, an implementation liaison designated from your university, and then within. Two years, you need to start some planning processes, and all these are laid out specifically in the commitment text, so that would be from us. And then how campuses set their, say, carbon neutrality goals and dates for uh, meeting benchmarks around resilience, that's all uh, really internally to those campuses. As a national organization, you can't, I think you provide the framework, but we don't dictate the specifics on a lot of those um, goals, because each campus is different. You know, it's very different depending on culturally where you are, um, or even you know institutionally where your campus has, has been. So there's um, clear things in the commitments that we can send around to you that they're, you know, they're, they're publicly listed, but each campus really has, works out the details on that. So you, you aren't asking them for carbon neutrality by 2030 or anything? No. Uh, the exact number of the network. Most of them, most of the network has 2050, and this is from the ACPCC. Um, 2050. Yeah, 2050 as their carbon neutrality date. That seemed to be the one that people kind of oscillated around. Um, but many, like I said, a number are, are 2020, you know, 40 or 2023 have become carbon neutral already. Um, so it just depends. And some schools now, one of the things we've introduced now is to revisit that climate action plan every five years. So it really is a chance to rethink what it is our goals were, you know, as the world has changed and as you as an institution has changed. So people have actually changed their carbon neutrality dates and some have increased it, uh, bumped it up. Cornell recently uh, did that. So it's a, you know, it's a framework, it's a planning process, and um, most of those dates are roughly in the carbon neutrality. How does this fit in with green building and living building challenge and water? I mean, there, there are a lot of different measurements in a lot of different ways. Like we all, all coordinate. Yep. Yeah, that's a great question. We recently, a couple weeks ago, um, the U.S. Green Building Council, us, uh, AISHI, National Wildlife Federation all got together in DC at the high level and we said how can how can we partner you know how can we work more explicitly together not just in kind of superficial ways but in really deep ways and you know lead obviously from USGBC's perspective is really important and one of the tangible actions was you could have lead uh, certification as a standard on your campus that, that initially you know in 2009 was um, or 2006 was part of the ACPCC um, many schools have lead standards as their um, baseline building conditions. And many of them do that because they have this general sustainability commitment as reflected either in the ACPCC or otherwise. So it, it really is integrated together. I think we're looking for opportunities to make that even on the data side more explicit. And I think we can share uh, you know, potentially some data frameworks with groups like the USGBC and um, AISHI to help think about how can we cross compare STARS, which is AISHI's initiative, USGBC's lead, and you know the progress that's being made as part of these commitments. I think it's a really great opportunity to do that, and we're actively having those conversations. And feel free if anybody else wants to chime in how lead or the commitments of, I know Elizabeth, you were talking a little bit yesterday about how you know the being a signatory and now you have these lead standards for all your renovations, even in these old historic places, which is Absolutely, and it, it definitely, the, all of these were integrated for us. Um, yeah. It was because we were part of the commitment is why 
our board embraced the idea of LEED Silver or higher. This is actually the first LEED certified building in the city of Decatur um, that we're, we're in uh, this morning. But yes, and I think water is a really important issue, particularly in some parts of the country. And, and you know, who knows? I mean, I, I think this will evolve. And there, there may, you know, for, for resilience, water will play a very significant role, I think, uh, for many of us in, in different ways, whether it's too much or too little. Um, and uh, so I think you know, it's a great question. I think all of this is uh, resilience enables us to take a really big look at all of the climate threats and uh, and how do they how will they impact our, our regions? Yeah, and we've really taken uh, on the guidance a systems approach to think about how can you think about either a water system or an energy system or your you know transportation system uh, from a resilience perspective. So that kind of helps uh, maybe broaden a little bit the the framing outside of just the energy sector, which is largely on the mitigation side. Can one of the presidents give us an idea of what this new um, uh, movement will look like on your campuses, particularly for your students and the new system? Can you talk to you about an idea maybe President Keats can start with this? Sure. Sure. So, well, we've been, um, we, you know, we've really engaged our students in, uh, throughout the last 10 years, you know, since we signed on to the carbon, what's now called the carbon commitment. And so I think we'll, we'll continue to build on that deep level of student engagement. So our st students have done our greenhouse gas emissions inventory, mentored by faculty. Um, we have students on our green revolving fund committee making decisions about energy efficiency projects. Um, and you know, we have curricular components now, our, our um, sustainability studies minor. Now, as we take it to resilience, uh, you know, one of the great pieces will be, and she was here, she's here, Elizabeth Rowe is a 2015 graduate. She's our Sustainability Fellow, which is a position we've had for a number of years, and it's actually co-funded by the city of Decatur, so it's this great public-private um, partnership. Uh, and we are now in active conversations with the city of Decatur to hire a shared energy manager um, that would be you know, shared between the city and the, and the campus. So as we develop our resilient strategic plan, we're gonna be building on that history of student involvement and involvement with our local communities and, and building out some, you know, like you, uh, this is true, I'm sure every president in the room, we already collaborate with um, public safety, emergency preparedness folks in, in our local community, but how do we add this lens of climate change and how climate change is going to impact um, our, our, our region. And so for us, it'll be a great opportunity in our sustainability studies classes for students to study that. You know, so how does the Southeast, you know, there's, there's a, a now in the last year, I guess, was when the, the federal climate um, report was, uh, was made public and it goes region by region. What, what is the impact gonna be in the Southeast, in the Midwest, et cetera? And so using that as a curricular piece for students and having them then drill down, okay, so if the South, if there's sunny day flooding in Miami, there isn't gonna be sunny day flooding in, at, in Decatur, Georgia, because we're on the, the, the uh, watershed, uh, you know, between the Gulf and the Atlantic, but what are the impacts here? Um, what are the impacts of cycles of drought and, and too much rain as we had recently? Uh, what are the impacts of severe weather events? What is the nature of our emergency preparedness right now and how do we make it stronger? So it's gonna be a great learning opportunity and research opportunity for our students and then we really wanna get them engaged in conversation with, um, with the city and that of course incorporates Atlanta as well. Atlanta has just appointed in fact, we may be joined later this morning by some folks from the city. Atlanta has just appointed a resiliency coordinator, um, a, a new head of emergency preparedness who's working closely with that Office of Sustainability. So I think you know, the cities are also starting to really connect the dots in this way, but our opportunity, I think, for all the colleges here, universities here, will be how can we be a convener and thought leader in that process? Because um, it is very new, the whole notion of, <laughs> Climate change is happening and we have to adjust and adapt to it right now. It's not just, oh my gosh, if we don't mitigate this, it's gonna be catastrophic in the second half of the 21st century. Climate change is happening right now. And that We need to be leading that conversation. And for us, we need to have our students integrally involved with it. 
you don't have to answer this question, but um, we're in a state where most, the majority of the state legislators have said they don't believe climate change is happening. Oh, yes. And uh, is there a greater freedom of the fact that you're a privately funded institution where you can lead this conversation in the community than maybe some of your colleagues in state funded institutions? That's a great question. Yeah. Um, I mean, <laughs> I, I said so. you don't have to well, you know, I would say, you know, our, our friends at Georgia Tech, for example, are doing great work around research around climate change. They just received a $30 million grant from the Candida Fund, as I'm sure you both know, uh, for a uh, kind of a living, learning laboratory. Um, so, so there's great leadership being presented by the, the um, state institutions as well. But there's a way in which, uh, there, you know, there's a certain freedom for a, a private college uh, to, to speak up. Um, and we've certainly spoken up in a lot of forums uh, around the importance of, of facing the reality of, of climate change. Um, and so for, and, you know, for us, even more generally, um, you know, Paul mentioned your strategic vision. You know, we're launching this very exciting new initiative summit this fall where every student has a core curriculum focused on global learning and leadership development. So that's our, you know, our mission now is to educate change agents in a global society. What issue is more important than climate change, right, to, for that? So, so we also have a strong missional focus to say we need to, if we're gonna educate change agents in a global society, we have to be willing to stand up ourselves as an institution. And I'm very fortunate in having um, a board that is very supportive of all this and in <laughs> fact has been, uh, and I know that's not true at every college. You know, there are, uh, there are hired institutions where people have trustees who are climate change deniers. And, and so I, I recognize how fortunate we are in having a very, uh, a board that really gets it. I think Elizabeth hits on some really key points. My name's Brian Albert, I'm from Gateway Technical College in Wisconsin. So whether or not, on a political stance, you believe in climate neutrality, climate commitment, the resiliency component to this effort now changes the equation quite a bit because where I'm from, the protection of the Great Lakes is essential to any political bias you might have. So we can talk about fresh water and things like flooding or things like tornadoes or any other type of circumstance that might happen to our community has a direct impact on the protection of the water in the Great Lakes. So you can create a different type of conversation around resiliency types of issues. And so we hope to leverage that in not only creating greater awareness on campus, but greater awareness throughout the communities on the decisions that we make in all assets of our, of our lives in order to try to help assure that the next generation has as, as much opportunity as we have. But I think resiliency is going to be an important part of that conversation going forward. Okay. Even in California, where there are, uh, we still have some climate deniers as well, um, but at a large public institution that is very diverse, we see ourselves as um, sort of a living laboratory, if you will, and engaging with our communities, which most universities do, uh, and now being focused on, in our case, uh, water issues. I mean, it is, it is truly, significant that, that more universities haven't signed on, in my view, even from the great state of California. But the point is, um, I, I see us and, and this uh, new commitment as an opportunity to truly be leaders, and, and we're educating uh, a very, very diverse population to be leaders on their own when they, in their communities, and in working with our communities to be able to use our research, use our education, use our leadership, if you will, to how are we going to adapt uh, in a new age where there's not going to be as much water? And, and how do we deal with that? And it's, I, I just think it's a natural thing to do, but it's also um, not so natural that everybody's doing it, which, which is still a little bit of a surprise. And you were asking earlier, how do we, how do we get other campuses and universities to sign on. We all have a variety of, of networks that we operate in, and we've, we've tried to reach out to some of those networks that, um, whether it's for public institutions, whether it is um, you know, a research network, a, a 
education network and athletic network. We're, we're looking at all different kinds of ways to, to get people onto this. And it's, I just think it's wonderful that the, the merging of these two different commitments. So. Yeah, I was going to say that the regional network that I operate in is in the middle of Appalachia. Uh, the richest coal mines in the entire United States. Coal has or, nothing to do with it. Or 45 miles from us. Uh, the people who will make the difference in whether or not Henry and Henry has a significant endowment in the next 50 years are the people who made millions and millions of dollars in the coal industry. They sold out 10 years ago when coal was at its peak. And now our conversation with them is to try to talk to them about, you know, the world that their children and grandchildren are inheriting. And so when we talk about our signing on to the resilience yeah. commitment and that conversation in that part of America, yeah. we're talking about a conversation that's going to be very difficult to have mm -hmm. and where we could lose a lot in terms of building a future for Henry and Henry College but gain a lot in how much we inspire our students. And I hope there is some magic in between there. I think it's worth mentioning that in all three commitments, there is a requirement that campuses will have climate action as part of the student experience, whether it's curricular, co-curricular, or otherwise. That's a universal feature of all three commitments. And then also a commitment to having research around these issues be part of what the campus commits to. That's, again, something that's universal amongst all three. And it's important to recognize that sometimes it's easier to do the operational stuff or at least have that conversation with your operational folks than it is with your faculty. And I think one of the really great opportunities is, is to explore how the uh, educational uh, experience can really be transformative as we introduce this new piece to um, one last question, maybe, if you want. Okay. All right, so I think we're going to now transition up front, and we'll do a signing for everybody. So do you want to go meet it? So all, I guess all presidents come up front. We're going to have some group pictures.
Second Nature staff, but just to call out in particular, um, Michelle Medea is here and Gabriela Bosio. They've had a huge role to play in setting all this up. Thank you for them. Um, Anne has been our resilience guru, so I can say the resilience, yeah, she is an official guru. Um, resilience wouldn't have happened without Anne, so thank you to Anne. And then Devin, is Devin around? She's a, she went to oh, the, she, oh, yeah. the other. So Devin really, you know, obviously everyone has been talking to Devin at some point. <laughs> and then there's a lot of staff who are actually still in Boston who aren't here who also helped support, recruit, get the word out. So I just want to say thank you to them. Um, we couldn't have done it without you. So um, virtual clap. For you. <laughs> um, and so now we are... You're going to... We're going to follow... You're all going to follow Gabriella and walk over to the next meeting location. Okay. Just Great. a short walk away. And if anybody wants to grab a, um, a pastry or an apple or